Okay, let's get started. Um, first, just to remind everybody, we have a midterm coming up, and um, there is an exam prep page that's up on edX. There's a post about it on Piazza. There will be some more information blasted to you via Piazza um, as we get a little bit closer with some more logistics. Um, any administrative questions or anything like that before we get started today? Okay, so today we're going to continue talking about machine learning, and we're going to mostly focus on a classification method called the perceptron, which is also used as a building block for a bunch of other approaches and technologies. So first, I want to quickly revisit what we talked about at the end of last class when we were looking carefully at generalization and overfitting. And in particular, last class, we were talking about classifying using naive Bayes, which means a very simple Bayes net that assumes that the class that you want to predict generates the features and that the features are all conditionally independent given the class. We ran through some particular um, examples with both digit recognition and with spam prediction, and we saw that if you just take your um, probabilities directly from the data using what are called the empirical or maximum likelihood estimates, that you can get bad performance. Uh, but we didn't really solve it. So we're going to do that really quickly now. If you remember back to our overfitting example, if you remember in Naive Bayes, the important thing that drives the classification one way or another for the classifier isn't actually the probability of a word given each of the classes um, in, this, in this text example, because we all know that words like the are going to be very likely in both spam and ham. And other words, even if they're very indicative of spam, may be very rare in both. What's important is the relative odds, the, the, what's called the odds ratio that's shown here. And so what we expect, or what, what, seem, what seems reasonable intuitively based on our knowledge of the domain, is that if you see a word like free, um, that words like that should be much more common in spam emails than in good emails. And so the ratio of probability of free given spam to free given ham should be a big number. Maybe it's 10 times more likely in a spam email and so when you see a word like that, um, it, uh, it increases your belief of one class versus another. However, if you actually look at the specific probabilities of the words in the data as computed by the counts in the various uh, examples, we saw that you get kind of nonsense. In particular, in, um, if you look at either of the odds ratios, you get a bunch of words that instead of saying free is 10 times more likely in spam, Instead, you get things like the word screens is infinitely more likely in spam. And that's probably wrong. And what probably happened here, in fact, what did happen here, is that in this training set, the word screens occurred once in a spam email and zero times in any of the ham emails. And so as a result, you've got this kind of, you've got the problem that just because it never occurred in your training set with the class ham doesn't mean it never will in the test set. And that's, that's a kind of overfitting, okay? So, um, we wanted to fix that, and, and we actually motivated a m one particular method. This is not the only method. It's certainly not the most sophisticated method. More sophisticated methods show up in classes like 281A or 288. But we, um, we came up with something called Laplace's rule, which says that if you're estimating the probability of something, like jelly beans coming out of a jar, and you see something like two red jelly beans and one blue jelly bean, you should, in addition to the data that you see, which would suggest here um, two-thirds chance of red, you should pretend that you saw every outcome a certain number of times, even before you see the data. Right? And formally, this can actually be derived as a prior, um, but you can think of this as essentially representing your belief before you see the data that you have some particular distribution, perhaps a uniform one. And in this case, where you assume everything was equally likely before you see the data, that represents a uniform prior. So for example, if you go over here and you see um, two reds and a blue, and you use zero as your bonus counts, you set k equal to zero here, you won't get any smoothing at all. You'll get the empirical estimate, or the maximum likelihood estimate, that red is twice as likely as blue, two-thirds, one-third. If you use Laplace's original law that he came up with on kind of principle, then you'll add one, so that instead of two reds, there will be three reds, and instead of one blue, there will be two blues, and then the ratio will come out three-fifths and two-fifths, which is somewhere between the empirical ratio of two to one and the uniform prior that you've assumed by using this rule. So you can see here, 
Um, this has a particular advantage, which is even if there were no observations of blue, you would still assign it um, something other than zero probability, which helps prevent those infinities and zeros, which are gonna wreck your classification. Now, of course, if instead of adding one, you add 100, that's a lot of smoothing, and what will you get? Well, instead of two reds, there will be 102 reds. Instead of one blue, there will be 101 blues. And so basically the probabilities come out to be 50-50, even if you have a reasonable amount of data suggesting otherwise. So there's this delicate game here where if you, um, if you don't do any smoothing at all, then things that occurred zero times in a certain configuration will be given zero probability, and we know that's gonna wreck classification. Okay, that's gonna overfit our data and will not generalize well, right? So that's insufficient generalization. We know that if we generalize, if we kind of try to generalize too much, if we try to smooth too much, then we're gonna get an answer that says 50-50 regardless of our data. And if we ignore our data, we're obviously not gonna get very good classification because the classifier is gonna be independent of the training. So really there's gonna be some sweet spot. Um, it's probably not actually gonna be the count one, but there's gonna be somewhere in between. And the idea here is now we've actually got two kinds of things to learn when we train a classifier. And this is a very important point that often gets lost. You've got the kind of lion's share of the parameters, which are what is the probability of the word free given spam? What is the probability that pixel 73 is on if the digit is seven? Most of those parameters um, are gonna be trained from your training data. But there's this extra kind of, in this case, what's called a hyperparameter, which is how much should we smooth? What should K be? And that's something that you can't set on your training data. So, um, so that's something we're gonna have to set on other data. Now, if you actually go back and you look, um, if you look at uh, the odds ratios once you've done a reasonable amount of smoothing, suddenly the words that are most indicative aren't words like screen that occurred once versus zero times, because those will be smoothed out to be a uniform, which will be an odds ratio very close to one. Instead, what you get now are the words which occurred a lot of times, but with a very skewed distribution. So, for example, some of these will make more sense than others. The word money here is 26 and a half times more likely under a smooth odds ratio in spam than ham. That's reasonable. You see the word money and your belief in spam should skyrocket. Credit, that's the same, capital order. Um, maybe some things don't seem quite so clear, like what's going on in here with Verdana versus Helvetica? Spammers really like Verdana? Does anybody know what's going on there? This has to do with the default fonts on various systems. So in this area, these, are, these reflect the default fonts on Mac versus PC. You can take from that whatever you like. Um, anyway, <clears throat> now, our classification, now our classification robots hat fits a little bit better. And the idea here is that now that we've, um, we've kind of washed away the noise, we haven't fit all the minuscule patterns of the data, we're able to get the real patterns that will generalize to unseen examples and let us classify well. So um, you can think of this not just as learning, but also as tuning. So you've got these thousands and thousands of probabilities, you're gonna get them from your training data. You've got this one number, or five numbers, depending on what your classifier does. Maybe you've got this one number K, but now you've gotta tune it up and down. And if you tune it one way, you don't get enough generalization. If you tune it the other way, you don't kind of look at your data closely enough, and you have to find that magic balance. And that's not training anymore, that's, that's something called tuning. So in general, um, you get the following kinds of graphs. So if you imagine you want accuracy to go up, so here's an axis with accuracy, and you can take K and you can make it big. Remember, if you make K big, you're really kind of smooth the heck out of these distributions, and eventually they're not gonna even look at the data. They're just gonna all be uniform, right? Or you can K make K really small, and then for naive Bayes, right, if K is really small, then you don't do any smoothing at all, and you fit your training data really closely. The reason why you can't choose K on your training set is because although all those zeros and infinities will kind of prevent you from generalizing, you'll do great on your training set. You memorize every last little detail, and so what you see is what, what's shown here in the blue line, that the answer, if you want high training accuracy, is to do as little smoothing as possible and, over the, and overfit the heck out of everything. That's why what we do is we take out this green set, we take out what's called held out data, which we're allowed to train on, but we don't. We take it and we don't use it uh, to compute counts of, in the case of naive Bayes, but we use that as a simulator of our test set to see how much smoothing or whatever kind of tuning and hyperparameter selection we wanna do uh, is just right. And then on the held out data, you'll see that if K is too small, you get low accuracy. If K is too big, you get lower accuracy. And there's some magic point where you get a good trade-off between, um, between generalization 
and, um, and overfitting. And that will probably not exactly be the same as on the test set, but hopefully it'll be close enough. Certainly better than looking at your training set where you'll never see any evidence that you've overfit because you're looking at the very data that you've overfit. Okay, so you learn your parameters from the training data, you tune any hyperparameters, in the case of Naive Bayes, that's things like the smoothing amount K on different data called held out data, and then once you've picked your amount K, now your classifier is done, and you can go to the test set and uh, see how you're doing. Any questions on that? That's to finish out the end of last class. All right. So what we're gonna talk about today is um, error-driven classification. So it's not necessarily the case that naive Bayes won't work very well. In fact, very often it works extremely well, and it's pretty much the workhorse out in industry. So it's one of the first things you'll try in most scenarios for a couple reasons. Uh, we'll be able to talk about those reasons more once we've seen what the alternatives look like. But there's a whole other class of classification mechanisms um, that operate in a very different way. Naive Bayes was model-based. We write down a naive, we write down a Bayes net, albeit a simplistic one, Based on the assumptions in that, we can then learn all our conditional probabilities from the data, and then we use probabilistic inference to reconstruct the predictions. In an error-driven method, we don't build a model. We just have features, and we directly tune the weights of the features in a way that tries to minimize errors. So uh, we're going to see one example of error-driven classification today. That's the perceptron algorithm and some variants. Um, but the motivation for these methods is that things like naive Bayes tend to work well when the model's a good model, and in the particular case of text, naive base tends to work well when you've got homogeneous features, like each feature is, is, a, is a word occurrence or something like that. But you're still gonna have errors, right? You kind of, you do all your, your smoothing and tuning and you do everything just right, and uh, you're still gonna have errors. So what are you gonna do? So here's two errors that in the naive base classifier that I've been showing you, this, um, these are two mistakes that the system makes. The first one, dear Globalscape customer, Globalscape has partnered with Scansoft to offer you the latest version of OmniPage Pro for just $100. Versus, to receive your $30 Amazon promotional certificate, click through to amazon.com slash apparel. Okay, so it got these wrong. And actually, if you look at these, these are pretty similar, right? Um, they both look like some kind of offer. Whether these are spam really has more to do with whether or not this is an unsolicited offer, and there's not a lot in the email itself that reveals that. So you can't just kind of stare really closely at the words um, and expect to get all of your errors going away. So you might think of other kinds of features uh, that are definitely not homogeneous features with the words. There are things like, um, have you had correspondence with the sender? Have a million other people just gotten the same email? Um, is the sending information legitimate? This is how a lot of phishing is detected. Um, uh, do the URLs point where they say? And you could imagine kind of uh, more and more complex versions of these. And if you have lots of different kinds of features, what you really want is you want to be able to basically throw the features in, not have to think about what's conditionally independent of what. Just throw the features into your, uh, your representation vectors and then somehow just have an automatic procedure that minimizes errors. And Naive Bayes models can take a variety of features, but again, um, when the features are kind of on very different scales or um, they're very much non-independent and, and in different ways amongst the subsets of features, then uh, sometimes Naive Bayes models aren't the right way to go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about a method called the perceptron, and later on, partly today and partly later, we're gonna talk about other approaches to classification, uh, which include web search and a decision problem for Pac-Man, which is gonna be uh, the core of your project fives. So I'll show you that at the end. Okay, any questions before we talk a little bit about linear classifiers? Okay, so linear classification um, is basically a general approach and it's a way of representing a rule for making a decision. It's not, it's not um, we're not yet talking about how you learn the parameters of the model, just the structural form that the predictors take. So for example, um, in, the case of, in the case of the spam filtering example, the input's X, right? That's some object. In this case, it's a, a document or there may be metadata or there may be information from the server about re recipient information. Okay, X is the object you're trying to classify. And the pipeline is you take X, you run some code which turns it into a feature vector. Usually feature vectors are represented in a sparse way, but mathematically they're a vector. The axes, um, the axes of the feature vector are whatever features you've defined. So for example, the number of times the word free occurs. In this particular X, that might be two. How did I detect that? I got a little kind of word counter that's X. So there's like 
there's code that lives kind of in here. Um, your name in, it occurs in this email. This email doesn't have my name, so I get zero on that uh, coordinate. There are two misspelled words, it's not from my friend, and so on. And as I kind of invent more features, this vector just gets larger and larger, right? And so it's gonna turn out some of the coordinates in this vector represent really informative features and are strongly correlated with the classification, and other axes may actually just be noise, right? Um, and then, so the pipeline is, you take your x, you run some code to distill it down to a vector of features that you've defined. Now it's a vector, right? Um, so we can do vector things to it, like take dot products. Then, you've got some classification um, rule that lives in here that looks at a feature and says a class. For example, it looks at a feature vector like this and says whether or not it's spam or whether it's the positive class or negative class uh, or red or blue or whatever. So the same pipeline works for OCR or any other task. You've got X, which in this case is maybe like a PNG file or something like that. Then you process it using some code and you extract whatever it is, picture thresh uh, pixel thresholds or number of loops or connected components. You'll be able to play with this in your project fives. And then you've got a classifier which looks at this instance and, and predicts one of the classes. And in the case of OCR, there are 10 possible classes, whereas for spam, it's what's called binary classification with two classes. Okay, so for today, we're now gonna basically concentrate on this part. We assume there are feature vectors which are descriptive. We're not gonna think today about what features we use to make them descriptive. We're just gonna think about what functions map from a real vector, though of course they may just be zeros and ones, a real vector to a prediction. Okay, so um, the perceptron was originally proposed as a, kind of an analog to human, the kind of human neuron. But you can push this, you can really easily push this analogy too far. So, um, a very simplified and probably oversimplified take on the neuron, people were just kind of realizing that human neurons do something and it's kind of circuit-like. So what happens is other neurons are out there, doing, they're doing their thing, and little electrical impulses come in on this end. So a bunch of electrical impulses come in that represent something that's going on in the world or elsewhere in your brain. So the pattern of these electrical impulses is kind of like the features, right? Then what happens? These impulses come in and this neuron has a job to do. Maybe its job is to like, detect whether or not you're kind of looking at a human face or something like that. So this neuron has a job to do, and if enough impulses come in from the right other neurons, then it hits some threshold and it blasts out kind of a signal uh, uh, off to elsewhere in the brain that says, uh, you know, positive class. I've seen a face or whatever it is this neuron's designed to do. I'm hungry. Okay, so that's the kind of caricature of a neuron. Electrical impulses come in on the left, they go through some thresholding, and then they kind of, uh, maybe an impulse goes off, uh, off to the right. Okay, if you know anything about neurobiology, you'll realize uh, how vastly oversimplified that is. But if you think about a neuron like that, it actually sounds a lot like a kind of a circuit, right? So what would the circuit look like? Ooh, well, um, here's, a, here's the cartoon version of the circuit. You've essentially got inputs that come in on the left, they get added up, right, with some weights maybe, and then there's a thresholding, we know what that is, that's a comparison with some constant, and then there's some if statement that says if you're over the threshold, then use the output one. So when people um, realized that neurons, at least in a caricature, computed something that looks a little bit like a circuit, people got excited, they started thinking about you could build networks of these, maybe that's a synthetic mind, or what could you do with even just a single neuron, right? Maybe a single neuron itself, uh, which was called a perceptron uh, in its synthetic guise, could be really powerful. So we'll talk about, uh, uh, next week we'll talk, or possibly, um, possibly on Thursday, we'll talk uh, about neural nets, what you get when you chain these things together. But for now, we're gonna talk about one lonely little perceptron, which is basically a, a, a kind of a caricature of a caricature of the, how neurons really work. So it looks like this. The inputs to this thing, the perceptron, are feature values. That's your vector of informative real numbers that you've computed, okay? Then each feature has a weight. Right, so some of these features, like if, for example, if this neuron's supposed to fire if it sees spam, then maybe the feature that corresponds to the word free should have a high weight, right? You see that word and you're, you get excited, you get activated, right? But maybe you see something like your name, right? That's a feature as well, but it should maybe have low weight, because if your name is present, maybe that should kind of work against the hypothesis that it's spam. And so each feature has a weight. Positive means it's, um, it's kind of pushing, it's voting towards uh, the, the activated class. Negative means 
it's inhibiting that class. And so what you do is you sum up the feature values times their weight. That's what's called an activation. So I can write that this way. I can write it as a sum or as a dot product. This is the activation of input x, which is represented by some feature vector f of x. Um, for some particular weight vector, what do I do? I go through all of the coordinates in my feature, which mean, in my feature vector, which means all of the features that I've defined that they're indexed by i. And for each one, I take the feature value, like how many times the word free occurs, times the weight that it votes with, and this could be positive or negative or zero. Zero is what we would get if it was kind of an, a, some kind of noise feature. And that can be written more compactly as this dot product. You take the feature vector, you take the weight vector, you take the dot product. If this dot product or this weighted sum is big, it means you've seen a lot of cues um, in the direction of the positive class. If it's negative, it means that it's probably not an element of the positive class. So what do we do with this activation? In the binary case, we would threshold it. And if we reach some threshold, this artificial neuron fires, and we say, that's spam. So um, the easiest form of this is to say that the threshold is actually at zero. If you don't want that, you can make a special component of your feature vector. Right? You can have your feature vector, which contains all of these informative features. You can make the first feature always be the constant one. And now the weight on that first feature effectively redefines the threshold. If you have a constant feature that's designed to move a, uh, an intercept term up and, up and down, that's called a bias feature. OK, in any case, you take this activation. If it's positive, you say plus 1. If it's negative, you say minus 1, right? A real neuron would just do nothing, but we're going to kind of output plus 1 or minus 1. All right, does that make sense? I haven't told you how to define the features. That's, the, that's up to you um, with your knowledge of the domain. And I certainly haven't told you how to learn the weights. That's what we're going to see in the perceptron algorithm in a couple minutes. OK, but this is the form of the classifier. One feature vector, one weight vector. You take the dot product. And if it's big enough, you say it's in the positive class at least in the binary case. OK, you can think of this like a little circuit diagram. And if you did this, you could imagine chaining them together. But we won't do that today. All right, so in the binary case, what are we doing? We've got um, a weight vector, right? There's one weight vector and a whole bunch of different examples. And each example is going to be some point in a vector space. Because this one has a bunch of occurrences of the word free, so it's over here in vector space. This one has a bunch of occurrences of my name, so it's in some other part of the vector space. Um, and the weight vector is also a point in the same vector space. Because for each feature, there's a weight which says a positive weight means it's the positive class, and negative weight means it's the negative class, and so on. So we might have a weight, fe weight vector that looks like this. This corresponds to the weight vector where free is a strong positive activation. My name is a weak negative activation. A misspelled word is a strong positive activation. And if it's from a friend, say, um, in my contacts list, that's a strong negative activation. This would be an appropriate feature if the positive class was spam. Right? A spam detector would, if a bunch of occurrences of the word free go in, it's going to fire. But if it's from my friend, maybe it won't fire. So this is a weight vector that kind of, you can think of this as like the prototypical spam vector or something like this. All right. So that's the weight vector. That represents some, something about the positive class here. And then there are going to be feature vectors, which are other points um, uh, in the vector space which correspond to your examples. So here's that example from earlier where um, whatever words it is, it's been distilled down to this vector where the word free occurs twice, and then there's a misspelled word. Um, there might be another one where uh, my name is in it. It's from my friend, but my friend misspelled some word. So each possible example is going to be some uh, red vector here. Okay. So what's the decision rule? The decision rule says, um, take your example, for example, this one. Take it. It's a vector. <clears throat> take your weights. They're a vector of the same dimensions. Take their dot product and check whether it's greater or less than 0, which really only has to do with the angle between them. right? So for x1, am I going to get a positive or a negative dot product? A positive dot product because the angle between these two vectors is, uh, is, is less than 90. OK, so in this case, if I try to classify this vector, I'll get a plus, which in this case might mean spam. But if I try to classify x2, I'm going to get a negative dot product, because it's greater than 90 degrees, the angle between them. And that means that I'll put this in the negative class. So this one would be called spam, and this one would be called ham. Okay. Any questions about that? So at this point, we've lost all notion of probabilities. Right? There's no conditional probabilities or prior distributions or anything like, like that. There are just weights and then our vectors, and the dot product tells us something about the class. So now we're going to have to somehow find weights that do the right thing when you dot product them against uh, examples. Okay? It's going to be our goal. 
So this is what's called a decision rule. You can think of this vector space. Um, it's commonly drawn as kind of uh, some low-dimensional real space. In practice, a lot of these, uh, that, that intuition can be misleading because a lot of your feature vectors are very high-dimensional, they're very sparse, and often the, the individual axes are 0, 1, which means actually you're in some very high-dimensional hypercube and your points that are, a bunch of different, are at a bunch of different corners of that hypercube. And so your geometric intuitions can fail you, but the standard way people draw this is to kind of imagine that the points are scattered on a two-dimensional space and that some of the points are, say, the positive class and some of the points are negative class. And what this linear function does is it puts a fence somewhere in your space and it says, I'm going to predict everything on this side over here, I'm going to predict positive, and everything on this side, I'm going to predict negative. Okay, so we've already seen the decision rule. Um, um, if you think about the space of feature vectors, then you think that, well, uh, where is the, um, where's the data point that's for the, the, where's the data point for free money, right? Free money is here. And money, money, money is up here. And free, free, free is over here, right? So you get the idea that this is just a two-dimensional feature space. Usually features are much bigger. Um, but every a document you can imagine is some point somewhere um, in this space, okay? Here's a weight vector. This weight vector has a bias. Um, that means that my first feature is always equal to one on all of my examples. And the bias has a negative weight. Um, if I see each occurrence of the word free is plus four, each occurrence of uh, money is at two. And so what I can do is I can think, all right, if this is my weight vector, and here's a bunch of feature vectors that I could possibly imagine, this weight vector is going to classify some of them into positive and some of them into negative. So where's the decision line? Well, right, so there's going to be some f here. What am I going to do with my f? I'm going to multiply it. I'm going to take the dot product with this weight. And then I'm going to check, is this kind of greater than or equal to zero? So I'm going to check whether it's kind of greater than zero, question mark, right? So the line of things that are kind of just barely on the decision line is going to be the line for the equation um, w dot f equals zero. And that's going to be some line here. Any point on this line, it'll be, a, it'll be a tie. Now, what do we do in ties? Kind of doesn't matter, right? But you could imagine that they always go into the positive class. So um, yeah, so the question was, was, what does the bias do? Well, although I've shown uh, uh, only two dimensions here, in general, you're going to have more features. Very often, uh, you, you set it up so that every single example has a special feature that's usually the first feature when you write it out, whose value is always 1. And that lets you get kind of intercept terms that, uh, into your linear equation. It's like when you do linear regression, you add an intercept term. OK, so there's some line, which is the line of uh, uh, where exactly f dot w is 0. These are the points which are orthogonal to um, your, your, um, your weight vector w. But everything on one side is called spam, and everything on the other side is called ham. So there's this line that separates things, and all predictions on one side are into one class, and the other side are into the other class. Now, you might say, well, what happens if my if my, um, my data points aren't separated by some clean line? Maybe there's some kind of round boundary or something's nonlinear. And we'll talk a little bit more about what happens when things are nonlinear. But for now, these decision rules are only capable of linear prediction. But note that it's, it's linear prediction over your features. And your features themselves are free to be nonlinear in the input. OK. So now we need, to do, we need to talk about learning. We need to figure out how you're actually going to learn uh, in the case of the perceptron. So we're going to do the binary case first, and then we're going to talk about the multi-class case, but they're extremely similar. So here's how it works. There's no probabilities involved. There's no counting things up in your training set and taking, uh, taking normalized ratios or anything like that. What you do is you start with your weight vector being 0. And then you're gonna, what you're going to do is walk through your training examples one by one. It's what's called an online method. You are presented with each example at a, one at a time, though you get to go back through if you want. Um, and you pick up each example and try to classify it. And if you get it right, good. And if you get it wrong, bad. And you need to do something to fix it. So you're going to start with the weight, vectors, uh, weight vector 0, which means you're going to get everything wrong at first. You're going to pick up each training instance in turn. So you pick up the first instance, and you try to classify it with your current weights. So you can think of this as you've got some decision boundary, which is probably wrong, that's represented by your weight vector. This new example, you imagine it drops in, and its label is revealed. So first you try to classify it, then you reveal its label. Um, if you were right, meaning what you classified, the prediction your, your 
uh, your current weights make are actually correct, then you don't need to make any change. So you don't make changes unless you make mistakes. Um, and so that's the case where, in fact, this, um, this point is correctly classified by your existing weights. But the question is, what happens if you're wrong? Right? That, means that, um, that means that you have been given an example. You've got some weight vectors that you've learned so far. You classify with them, but they make the wrong prediction. Well, there's something wrong with your weight vectors, because they just made a mistake. So what you're going to do is you're going to change the weight vectors. And you can think about that as taking this fence that separates the two classes, and you're going to move it. Right? Because changing the weight vector changes the location of this boundary. Um, and you're going to try to move it in a way that maybe puts it on the correct side of the example that you just got wrong. Okay, so that's the intuition. When you don't make a mistake, you're golden. When you do make a mistake, you change your weights so that they'll avoid this mistake in the future. Let's do that with a little more math. Um, so you're going to start with weight vector zero. You pick up um, the training instance. You classify it with the current weights. So what's shown here right now is uh, the current weight vector w. So this is what the weight vector is right now. It's just somewhere off in space. right? I guess if it's 0, it wouldn't actually be off in space. But um, in general, it's going to be somewhere off in space. Your instance comes in. So your training example is some vector f. right? Um, then what you do is you classify. So you look at basically the sign of the dot product, which really geometrically is about the, this angle. Look to see whether or not the dot product here is, um, is is positive or negative, meaning whether the angle is greater or less than uh, a right angle. And so what's going to happen is everything over here right, is going to receive the class plus, and everything over here um, is going to receive the class minus. So this particular f would receive the class plus. Are you right? Who knows? You've got to look at the label. So then the label is revealed to you. And if it's correct, then your weights are pretty good, because you just saw an example, and, the, and they worked. These weights worked for this example. When it's wrong, then we need to update w. And this is the tricky thing. Now we need to think about how we should update w. So let's imagine that here f, which we would classify as the positive class, because it looks a lot like w, right? Um, we want, uh, what if f was supposed to be negative? Right? <clears throat> that means essentially that um, we want f to be kind of at a large angle. We want it to be farther away from w. Well, how are we going to get it to be farther away? We can't move f. f is just some constant. But we can move w, so we should move it so that it kind of rotates away from f. And there are a lot of ways you could imagine rotating it, but a simple one is to just add and subtract copies of f. And so what you do here in the binary case is you take your w, and you want it to be less like f, so you subtract off f. So y star here is to handle the fact that sometimes there's a positive mistake and sometimes there's a negative mistake. But in this case, where we're talking about I would want to subtract off uh, uh, f here, and then my new w here would be the purple one. And as you can see, by subtracting off f, we've rotated it away from f. And that should make some uh, geometric sense, because if it's a lot like f, it's got a big component in f's direction. And if we subtract off f, we're reducing the component in f's direction. And if you imagine we kind of kept subtracting off f over and over and over again, eventually we would point in the opposite direction. It would start to look like negative f if we went kind of totally berserk. Okay, we're not going to go berserk. We're just going to subtract off one copy of f. And that might actually mean that we'll still make this mistake again. But we'll make it by less. We've made w less like f. Questions on that? Yep. Yeah, so uh, as I move my weights, the new one, well, I guess it depends on exactly what it is. But it looks like it would be something like this. right? And if I try to draw a gradient, it would look like that. Because that looks terrible. But you get the idea. Um, th this will be the new, uh, new boundary. It's always going to be, the classification boundary is always going to be orthogonal to the weight vector. Yep? That's a great question. The question is, why isn't there something useful to do when we're correct? Right? Maybe either kind of we want to reinforce this. And there are other classes of algorithms that do updates even when you're correct that try to either increase the margin of correctness. but. Um, but, uh, but essentially, in the Perceptron, you don't do that. And I will, uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about another algorithm that kind of gets at this intuition in a bit. In the Perceptron, you just don't. And there are some good reasons to not, but uh, we don't have the tools to talk about them yet. OK, so uh, well, there you go. It rotates. Um, all right, so in the separable case, here's what the Perceptron does. For the multi-class case, I'll show you an applet. For now, I'll just show you. Um, I'll show you um, this in, in uh, slides. So 
here is uh, a very easy data set. It's in two dimensions, and there is a right answer, right? That's basically what separable means. We'll define it formally in a bit, but it means there is a right answer. Um, and what's going to happen is we're going to pick up each example at a time, and then in response to that example, do an update to the weight vector. OK, in this case, there's a bias term, so I can't show you the weight vector. But what I can show you is the, is the hyperplane that separates. So what this means is we saw um, this example, and, in, and we made a mistake on it, so we pushed the boundary away. Now we're no longer going to make a mistake on this, but all these guys are now wrong. right? We pushed it too far in that direction. So what we'll do is we'll visit uh, data points until we make a mistake. And so maybe we visit this data point, we make a mistake, and so we push the weight vector away so that this data point will now be correctly classified as a 0. All right. Then we make a mistake on the other side, and the weight vector thrashes over, and then it bounces back, and then it bounces over, and then it bounces back. And eventually, uh, in this particular case, it stops. Right? This isn't confidence inspiring. So for what it's worth, I mean, just kind of watch it. This is not. This is two dimensions. This is not confidence inspiring. You kind of you lurch one way, you lurch the other way, you lurch back, and kind of maybe you stop. Now, where did we stop? Did we stop at like the perfect separator? No, we just kind of stop somewhere. And at this point, we won't ever make another mistake, right? Because this is the zero side and this is the plus side. We won't ever make another mistake, which means the algorithm is done. It's converged. Once you get through your whole training set without making a mistake, you're never going to make an update again, and you just have to stop. That's what the perceptron does, and in this particular case, uh, it converged um, to a hypothesis that separates the training data, meaning gets it all right. Okay. What about the multi-class case? We'll come back to the fact that that wasn't very confidence-inspiring. We'll come back to that later uh, <coughs> when we talk about improvements to the perceptron algorithm. Um, but let's look at the multi-class case. So in the multiple class case, there's, uh, there are a couple different ways people do multi-class classification. Um, what I think is the most intuitive one is to say there's now multiple weight vectors, one for each class. And each weight vector you can think of as, as kind, of, um, kind of embodying the prototypical element of that class. And so in this case down here, you might have uh, w1, w2, w3. And when you get a new instance, f of x, you take the dot product with each weight vector. A big dot product means w and f are similar. And so whichever weight vector wy has the highest dot product, that's your prediction. So your decision rule now is you take all the dot products, one feature vector, but you dot it against all of the different weight vectors. And whichever weight vector has the highest dot product wins, that's your prediction. That's going to induce boundaries that are kind of some kind of decomposition of the space based on which weight vector is, is, is closest. Right? It's not quite as simple as angles, because now the magnitudes of the vectors start to matter. But if all the vectors had the same magnitudes, it would be just kind of uh, it would just be kind of cutting the angles. Okay, so that's how multi-class works. Otherwise, it's the same. The prediction rule is the same, except now you take a bunch of activations, and the highest activation wins. Learning is basically also the same. You start with a weight vector that's going to make a ton of mistakes. You pick up your examples one by one. You do a prediction with the current weight vector, which means checking all of the activations, and the highest one wins. So this y is your prediction. Maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. Um, and if it's right, then you don't have to do anything. So let's take a look over here um, at the diagram. F here in red, that's your example. And all of the w's are the different classes weight vectors. OK, so they've got a bunch of diacritics on them. What does this mean? Uh, y star means the gold answer. That's what's in your training set. So that's the one you're supposed to predict. Y is the one that you do predict under your current weights, right? And then y prime is just kind of some rando that's sitting there. Um, so in this case, when we take these dot products, um, what are you going to get? You're going to get um, a big dot product with wy, and a big but not quite as big dot product with wy star, and you're going to predict wy. So you've made a mistake. You've predicted wy when you should have predicted wy star. So um, if this were correct, we wouldn't do anything. But if it's wrong, again, we want to have this intuition. We can't change f. f is just some constant. But what we can do is we can move the weight vectors around so that the, that the dot products work out better next time. And in particular, this guy over here, he's kind of not participating in the mistake. So we're going to leave him where he is. Uh, there won't be any updates to those weight vectors. But we wanted, let's say we wanted the dot product to be bigger with y star and smaller for y. So intuitively, we should kind of take y star and rotate it this way, and y and rotate it this way, so that y star becomes more like f, and y becomes less like f. Now, how are we going to rotate them? We're going to do the same game that we did before. We're going to add and subtract copies of the example. OK, so what we do is we say, well, y here had a dot product that was too big when dot producted 
dotted against f, so we're going to subtract off a copy of f. And you can see it rotates away from f. And y star, we wanted it to have a bigger dot product with f than it did. So we add in a component of f. And so y and y star rotate in the way we wanted by adding and subtracting copies of f off. So the update rule is super simple. You take your weights, you either do nothing with them, or you add and subtract f as appropriate. Um, so the question is, is it only the angle that matters? Because you're looking at the dot product, if you fixed all the angles but you doubled some w, you would double all of its dot products as well. And so some algorithms actually normalize the weights in various ways. In this case, it actually does matter. The magnitudes do matter. The angle intuition is really only for, uh, is only applicable to the extent that the magnitudes are the same. This is one of the many ways these two-dimensional diagrams don't always tell the whole story. Yeah, so the question is, how do you, especially in higher dimensions, how do you know that wy prime um, is kind of an innocent bystander? And it's not even clear in two dimensions that it is, because what if you had a weight vector that uh, was like, okay, so y was the mistake. Uh, there might be another one right here, which you didn't predict, but even if y went away, you would now make this new mistake, right? So in some sense, you can be making a whole bunch of mistakes, but we only are actually sensitive to the, the biggest mistake, the one you actually predicted. And there are, again, there are different algorithms that try to be sensitive to all of the, all of the mistakes at once. Um, this is a particularly sim simple algorithm. Um, uh, and people talk about notions of things like conservative algorithms that only do updates when they make a mistake, or algorithms that only update with respect to the most severe mistake. And this algorithm is very conservative. And you could imagine better algorithms that are more sensitive to all of the mistakes, but not this one. These are all good ideas. And these are all ideas that have kind of led to uh, a bunch of different research and different methods that are smarter than the perceptron. Okay. Um, I think actually I'm going to do an applet instead of uh, walking through a mistake by hand. <clears throat> um, let's do the applet. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's take a look at what we're looking at. It's probably going to take longer to decode this than to actually run it. So there are a bunch of dots. Um, there are dots in blue, red, and green. Those are the three classes here. Um, and um, the color of the dot represents the true class of that example. So each example is a point in space here. And that means, in this case, there are, there are, uh, there are two features. And um, they're all fractional, right? Because you can be, because they're not kind of aligned to integer boundaries here. They're not all 0, 1. Otherwise, they'd be sitting at the corners. Um, so these are the things that should be blue, these are the things that should be red, and these are the things that should be green. Now, there are also weight vectors. And these weight vectors at the moment are terrible, right? So this is the green weight vector. It points up here. This is the red weight vector, and this is the blue weight vector. And as you can see, they kind of slice up the space. Everything down here is going to be closer to red, and we're going to predict red for all of these points, which means they're all wrong, right? These are terrible weight vectors. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through, we're going to step through example by example. And for each example, if we make a mistake, we're going to add and subtract things off so that we won't be as sensitive to that mistake in the future. So for example, here, we predict a label. Um, uh, that's for this yellow point. This is the one we're currently looking at. So this yellow point, we predict red. Uh, sorry, we predict green, but it should be red. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this yellow vector, and we're going to subtract it off of the green vector and add it to the red vector. So let's make sure that works right. So green rotates away, red rotates towards. Okay. What? Yeah. Okay, now we go to this one. It's wrong. We predict red. We should have predicted green. And so we rotate red away from it and we rotate green towards it. Okay, and now we do this one. And we do this a whole bunch of times, and there's a whole bunch of rotations, and I'm just going to have it play. So you'll notice, among other things, the red vector is actually getting very small. You know, 
There are some algorithms that normalize these, but as you can see, what are we basically doing? Right? Over time, red, red points are being added to the red vector, blue points are being added to the blue vector, and green points are being added to the green vector. So kind of over time, it seems pretty inevitable that the blue vector is going to end up near where the blue points are, and the red vector is going to end up near where the red points are, and the green vector is going to end up near where the green points are. And this, in this case, will happen. So are we done? We're either done or we're close. So maybe we're done. OK, so you can, see, you can kind of see how this works. Now, you could think, wait a minute. Why don't you just take the green vector and set it equal to aver the average of the green points, or something like that? Well, you could. That would actually be surprisingly close to what Naive Bayes does. Unfortunately, that won't always be the thing that minimizes the errors. And this approach of only making updates when you make a mistake focuses the optimization of the parameters on the errors, and that in practice and in theory gives rise to kind of better generalization. OK, so let's stop that. This one's converged or close enough. Uh, we'll go back to uh, the slides. Any questions on that? Yep. I'm sorry, so the... <clears throat> Do you want to shift this counterclockwise? I mean, we have to kind of play with the exact numbers, but in principle, you could do it if you kind of rotated green and red, and then you may, sorry, you rotated blue and red the way you're talking about, and then maybe you ha would have to make green a little bit larger to make it kind of base and wider, right? Whether or not you could actually do a particular configuration, we'd have to kind of try the, the numbers. But there's, there's no inherent reason that you can't draw these lines kind of radially however you want. Right? Partly to do that, uh, you can also use the magnitude. Other questions? Yep. I'm sorry? What if you have noisy data? Um, you're screwed. Um, so let me actually go to that right now, and then we'll take a break in a couple minutes. <clears throat> so in the separable case, it actually turns out in the binary case you are guaranteed that if there is a setting of the weights, meaning if there is a separating hyperplane <clears throat> that gets your examples right, you'll learn it, okay? It's kind of amazing. It's not actually true in the multi-class case, but in the binary case, you're guaranteed that if it's separable, the perceptron will converge. Um, in the non-separable case, you're not guaranteed that. So separability, that means that there's some set of parameters get the, that get the training set correct. You are guaranteed that if the training set is separable, the perceptron will eventually converge to a separating uh, hypothesis. Not necessarily a good separating hypothesis, but a separating hypothesis. Um, and in fact, you're even given a mistake bound. You can quantify, um, although it's really kind of more for theoretical interest about how the, what the algorithm's sensitive to than the actual number you compute. Um, you can make a mistake bound, which tells you how many mistakes you could possibly make before you finally separate the data. And really, that's uh, proportional to uh, kind of how spread out the data is compared to how wide the gap between them is, which makes sense. If things are spread out with a big gap between them, it's easy to come up with a good hypothesis. There's kind of a lot of places in there you can draw the right line. <clears throat> OK, so that's all the good stuff for the separable case. And the non-separable case, like this. Well, there's no answer. There's no, um, there's no hypothesis that gets all of the training points right at the same time. So what will happen is you'll do this. Right? So those are the hypotheses um, that you get over kind of 100 runs of iterations of this algorithm. So they're all over the place. And they won't converge. Because whatever hypothesis you have, it makes a mistake somewhere. And when you get back to that example, you'll do an update. So you know that not only kind of won't it converge, it can't converge. It's not even possible with this algorithm to converge. So what do you do? Well, there are some hacks, and there's also better algorithms. So the hack people usually use for Perceptron is to say, all right, it's thrashing around, but, um, but really kind of the center of mass of these green lines is like here and is kind of reasonable. And so this is what's called the average Perceptron. You run it, you, keep tr you take a snapshot of the parameter uh, values every time through or after every instance, and then you average them together at the end. And in that case, here's the average. Is this the best possible uh, separator? No, right? It makes two mistakes, whereas you could make only one mistake. But at least it's not kind of undefined. 
right? So this is one answer is when there's noise, you have to switch to something like the average perceptron. But really there's some deeper problems with the perceptron. And uh, even though in practice it can actually be a, a kind of very powerful algorithm, there are better things people have come up with. Okay, so um, any questions still there? And then we'll, talk, we'll take a break and talk about improving the perceptron. All right, let's take about a two minute break and uh, then we'll try to fix some of these problems that we've seen. Okay, let's, uh, let's start again and see what we can do to improve the perceptron. So there are a bunch of things going on in the perceptron, and you've, you've already asked about a bunch of them. One uh, ha that happened during the break is, can you initialize it in some way other than, than zero? There's a question of, can you be sensitive to all of the mistakes you make, not just kind of the, the most severe one? Um, and there are other questions, too. And for each of these issues, there are other algorithms that address the question in a different way. We're not going to fix everything now, but we are going to try to address some of the problems with some simple fixes. So one problem with the perceptron is that when the data isn't, isn't separable, the weights are going to thrash around. Now we've already talked about one solution, which is if you average the weight vectors over time, that's called the average perceptron, then, uh, then that tends to work pretty well in practice. Right? And that's in some sense the worst of the problems. Um, but you know, during training, things do kind of thrash around. And it might be nice to know that um, you are actually, if there's no separating hypothesis, it might be nice to know which of the compromises you're going to get, rather than just running this confused thing, averaging it together, and observing in practice that it kind of works. OK, another issue is that even when the algorithm works, and by that I mean it converges to a set of weights which make no mistakes on the training data, um, there might be multiple, in fact, in general, if you can separate the data, there are a bunch of ways you can do it, right, by slightly tweaking that line. There might be some of the separating uh, hypotheses that are better than others. For example, it might be that straight down the middle is going to generalize better than something that's kind of just barely avoiding a mistake. They're the same to the perceptron algorithm. If you don't make any mistakes, you're done. It doesn't check to see a margin. It doesn't check to see how far away were you from making a mistake. It doesn't optimize anything like that. It just runs, and if it stops, it stops. Okay, and basically, you uh, kind of intuitively, it seems reasonable that you don't want any of your data points right, kind of at the edge of the boundary, getting squished by the boundary. Because if they were kind of if they were nudged just a tiny little bit, you would suddenly get them wrong. Okay, so it'd be nice if the the separating hypothesis was actually a, a, a one that generalizes well. And there's also an issue of overtraining. So it turns out. Um, for a pretty different reason than for naive Bayes, but with a very similar kind of symptom, um, as you train this thing, it's really good at driving down the error rate. And so you'll see that as you go through your training set, kind of the number of errors you make on each pass goes down and down and down and down. At the beginning, you're, making, you're getting everything wrong. You have no idea what's going on. And after a while, you're pretty good. And then you get better and better and better at stamping out the errors, which was the whole goal of this method to begin with. But it turns out that if you look at a test set or a proxy of that called a held out set, you'll see that um, your accuracy usually goes up and then starts going down. That's the point where you've started overfitting, although it's in a different way than how you overfit in naive bays. Sometimes here it's called overtraining. Um, and you can kind of think about this as, you know, you've you run the algorithm too, too long, right? It, it's, it's no longer generalizing, it's just kind of memorizing the training data at this point. It's a different kind of overfitting. So let's see if we can fix some of these issues. We're not going to fix all of them, um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, we can fix some. So here's one key idea, and it fixes some of these issues. And that is that when we do an update, right, the algorithm's going to be unchanged. We're going to pick up an example at a time. We're going to check to classify it. And if we get it right, we're going to do nothing. None of that will change. But when we get it wrong, maybe we shouldn't just be adding and subtracting weight vectors uh, kind of in, in a naive way. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to choose an update that's sensitive to the error you made. So one way of doing this, not the only way, is an algorithm uh, called Mira, which is basically a perceptron with an adaptive update size. So it looks like this. It says, all right, I messed up. What does it mean to get mess up? It means I guessed Y, which is wrong, instead of Y star, which was the goal. OK, if, if the weight vector is f of x, then what do I do in my update? What I do is I say, well, W, um, oops. what do I do in my update? I say, um, I would like to take uh, the weight vector for the mistaken class here and subtract off the feature vector so the dot product won't be so big anymore. And I'd like to take the target class and add in this feature vector so the dot product will be bigger next time. And you can think of that 
here, remember, if there's some other class y, y prime, it kind of just sits there on the sidelines. You can think of this as taking y star and rotating it towards f, and taking wy and rotating it away from f, but why this? Why not smaller uh, or bigger, right? So what size? So what we're going to do in this algorithm is we're going to keep the direction of the update. We're still going to add and subtract the feature vector, and that kind of makes sense because any, um, if, we, if we update in any direction other than f, there would be a component of the update orthogonal to f, and that means it would be kind of uh, orthogonal to, to uh, affecting this dot product, right? So we're kind of stuck with this direction under some reasonable assumptions, but we can make it, uh, we can make it bigger or less. So there's going to be this tau, which is the size of the step, and we're going to be smart about how big a step we take. In particular, we'd like to take a step size that fixes this mistake. So instead of just taking a step size where tau equals one all the time, we're going to set, uh, we're going to do the update that fixes the current mistake, but is otherwise as small as possible. We'd like to make the changes to the weight vectors as small as possible. Now it may not be obvious why you want them to be as small as possible, but it turns out that if you kind of every update has has a kind of a cost, right? Um, and in general, they kind of uh, you, you can think about when you update with f, you're kind of throwing in all the features that have to do with f, and they're getting these big updates. Um, and some of them may just be noise. And in general, it turns out, both in theory and in practice, that if you're sparser with these updates, that things work better. Um, though it'll be a while before we can kind of say formally why that's true. OK, so let's write that down. Let's write down the update that fixes the current mistake, but makes as little change to the weight vectors as possible. So I can write this out as a giant blob of math, but all it says is this. Right? It says, of all of the w's you could choose, which are really tau's, because that's the only real variable I have, I would like to do the following. I would like to change the w's as little as possible, as measured by the sum of squared errors, uh, sorry, the sum of squared differences. And I would like the following property to hold. I would like the dot product with the target class to be bigger than the dot product with the mistake I just made. And then to set a scale for this and help generalize, we, we insist that it not just be bigger, it be bigger by a unit, by one. Right, one here is an arbitrary scale. Otherwise, there's a solution here where they're equal, and then you set weights to zero, and that's no help. All right, so what does this actually mean? I'd like to make a small change to the weights, but I'd like to satisfy this inequality that I no longer make this mistake, that the correct prediction is bigger than the incorrect predi prediction by one. <clears throat> well, let's figure that out. So we know that the form of the, the update is what's shown in the upper right. We're going to take the weight vectors and add and subtract multiples of f. We'd like to make the smallest change possible in W. Because the only changes we're making to W is adding and subtracting tau, the step size, times f, I can rewrite this as make <coughs> the update, which is tau of f, as small as possible. And I can't control f. I can only control tau. So really, I'm minimizing tau squared. What's that? Tau is like a one-dimensional, it's a scalar. Which means minimizing it means making it as kind of small as possible, right? So this just says take the smallest update you can, but you have to satisfy this linear inequality that says you can, that says the score of the target has to exceed the score of um, the mistake that you just made by one. So I can write that out a little bit, but basically I'm minimizing tau squared. Tau squared looks like this. It's just a quadratic. Right? I don't need any kind of fancy optimization to know where the minimum is. It's at zero. Okay. Now, if I just minimize, if I kind of hid this inequality and I just said minimize tau squared, what would I do? I do tau squared equals. I would do tau equals zero, and I would do no update. So this equality is doing something. It says you would like to get tau as close to zero as possible, but because you have to get this inequality right, zero is not actually the the constrained minimum. Instead, there's going to be some smallest tau that actually is in the feasible region that gets this example correct. Right? So we know what the update's going to be like, and we can throw away most of the heavy-duty math here. We know that the update is going to be the smallest tau that um, makes this correct, which means it's going to be the tau that achieves equality um, in, in, uh, in this condition, this greater than or equal to. So we can just write that out. Right? The minimum is not 0, or we wouldn't have made an error here. So we just solve for the point where the score of the target equals the score of the mistake plus one. So we plug and chug. Like It is entirely reasonable for your eyes to glaze over right here. The point is, you plug and chug, and you end up with an expression that says tau is some easily computed function of the weights and the feature vector. 
Now, if you stare at this, it's actually reasonable, right? Um, the more different the weights are, the bigger an update you're going to need. And, um, and the bigger the weight vector, sorry, the bigger the feature vector f, the smaller an update you need, because kind of adding and subtracting f has a bigger effect to begin with. But it doesn't really matter. The point is, you get this tau by solving a system of equations here, and it gives you some magic update size. In practice, it turns out that sometimes, in order to fix an error, you need a huge update. For example, if you've got a whole bunch of data and one of the, the data points is incorrectly labeled, in order to fix it, you might need to make a huge update and wreck everything else. And so it turns out, um, both in practice and intuitively, um, and also in theory, um, that it's, it's bad to make updates that are too large. So it could be because of an incorrectly exampled label. It may be because you don't have enough features and your data just looks kind of all superimposed and you need to make compromises. So here's the solution. You take your example. If you're right, you do nothing. If you're wrong, you compute the smallest step size, which will fix this example. And the step size you take is either that, the smallest step size that will fix, but you also cap it at some quantity C, right, which is your maximum step size. If C is small, you only make tiny little updates for any example. That would be appropriate if uh, kind of there was a lot of noise everywhere and you didn't want one example to totally wreck everything. On the other hand, if C is large, it says each example can make an arbitrary update, and then you get kind of big swings. And so C here controls the, the kind of the, uh, your response to noise, and um, it's a kind of hyperparameter, right, that you will have to tune on some held out data. Now, if you look at this and you say, uh, okay, that looks a little sketchy there. Well, why did you just cap it? Why, aren't, why, is it wh why this form? It turns out you can derive this. And if you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit about support vector machines, but you can derive this from the optimization uh, that gives rise to the support vector machine. So this actually has some theoretical motivations, even though I just motivated it on these slides uh, in an intuitive way. You can actually derive this. Yeah, so what you would do, the question is how you should see on held out data. <clears throat> you would set it equal to one, you, you train on your training set, um, and you test on your held out set, you get some accuracy. And now you try C equals 0.5, now you try 0.1, and you try a bunch of different values. And whichever value of C gives you the highest accuracy on the held out set, um, you, you, you take. Now you might say, but I'm doing other things. I'm deciding when to stop iterating on the held out set. You might need two held out sets, right? There, there's, no, um, there's no one answer for how where the right trade-off is between a complicated uh, protocol for training and making sure you get independent uh, tuning parameters. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm gonna quickly tell you where that kind of idea leads and then I'm gonna show you a demo of, uh, of um, what your project fives are gonna look like. So this idea that I shouldn't just do an update, I should somehow do the right update, which means be conservative, update as little as possible, but fix the error, right? That gives rise to this tweak on the perceptron, but you can take it much further. You can say instead, um, if I could have my pick of any separator in the world, which one would I want? Right, so here's a bunch of lines. Which one should I want? They all separate the data, right? One reasonable answer is I'd like the one that goes right down the center, okay? And that's the idea that gives rise to what's called a support vector machine. So in a support vector machine, what you do, <clears throat> and I'm gonna do this only at the highest level, um, uh, what you do is you, pick amongst the, the hypotheses, you pick the one that maximizes what's called the margin, which is the distance to the closest point. So in this uh, example, these three are the closest points, all, all kind of equally close, and that's the biggest margin you can get. If I kind of draw another line here, I'm gonna have a much smaller margin. And so you can write down an, uh, an optimization problem that says, get me the biggest margin possible, subject to the constraint that I get all of my examples correct. And if you write that down, you actually end up something that looks a lot like Mira. So in Mira, what we did is um, we made the smallest weight change possible subject to the constraint that we no longer make the mistake we just made. In a support, support vector machine, what you do is you say instead, I would like the entire weight vector, not just the change in the weight vector, I'd like the entire weight vector to be small subject to the constraint that I make no mistakes. Now that's almost what I said. Right, those constraints, these say make no mistakes. And the idea of making the weight vector small, it turns out that this margin, right, this distance, 
is related to the size of the weight vector. So small weight vectors correspond to large margins. So instead of maximizing the margin, we minimize the weight vector. Um, <clears throat> um, basically then, a support vector machine is just like this idea that gave rise to the Mira update, except you do it globally. You do an optimization that gives you a weight vector for all of your points simultaneously. If you then um, make this so that you're kind of allowed to have some noise, like you're allowed to have a blue point up here, then you end up with something that looks a lot like Mira with a capacity cap of C. So a lot of what we just saw, even though we motivate it directly, comes from um, the math that gives rise to support vector machines, which I'm not going to go through, so happy to do that in office hours if anybody wants. OK, so you may have heard of support vector machines. That's what's going on there. <clears throat> OK, so to take stock of where we are now, and then we'll, we'll look at a preview of project five, um, we've seen two methods for classification. One is naive Bayes. That's model-based. We build a model, even if it's a stupid model, or I guess I should say a naive model, that assumes a lot of conditional independence. Because of that, we then can learn our parameters based on counts in the data. That's nice. You don't have to go through example by example trying to see whether or not you make a mistake. You just add stuff up and count. And that's often much more efficient. But you've made strong assumptions about feature independence. Um, <clears throat> um, on the other hand, you get uh, probabilities out. This is model-based classification. Perceptron and the upgrade that we talked about called Mira here, they make less assumptions about the data. They don't assume that the features are, are conditionally independent in any way. That's not to say they model interactions between the features, but when they set the weights, they don't assume independence. Learning is driven by mistakes, um, but that means you have to go through the data over and over again, checking to see where your mistakes still are. And that can be very, very slow in practice. It's often more accurate but there are lots of trade-offs. For example, sometimes naive base scales better. Sometimes it's much faster to train. Um, and so it's not always the case that the perceptron or methods like that will be preferred. Like I said, in practice, naive base is still the dominant thing in industry. And not just because people are like behind the times, because there are actually compelling reasons in practice to adopt it. <clears throat> OK. Give you a quick preview of. Uh, Project five. I'm going to talk about something called uh, apprenticeship. Um, this is not quite classification. This is meant to show you a way in which the ideas behind classification um, can be used for other related tasks. In this case, uh, something that looks more like reinforcement learning in a way, though, is, is deeply different, as we'll see. So an apprenticeship, rather than just trying to learn how to do something by trial and error and looking for reward signals like we did for reinforcement learning, instead, the learner is, <coughs> the, the learner is presented with an expert who already knows how to do the task. So rather than trying to discover rewards, you're just trying to learn how to do what the expert does, which means it's more like mimicry, which means it's more like classification. You're presented with a state, and you really ask yourself kind of what, what, would, what would the expert do. So, um, so let's see how this would work for Pac-Man. The, the objects X that you are classifying might be the states of the board. The candidates, meaning the labels, they're going to be north, south, east, or west. And, um, or stop, I guess. And we will define features over them, which are going to look almost exactly like the features you use for project two. Then you're going to have a linear function, which says your weights, which you're going to learn, times the features for a direction um, is a score, and you're going to choose the direction that takes the maximum score. So it's really just classification where your inputs are, um, <coughs> where your inputs are states, and um, where your inputs are states, and your classifications are actions. So you imagine you've got big Pac-Man here that is doing something expert-like. Maybe it's running minimax search with a good evaluation function. Who knows? And then you've got your learner who's trying to use its features and the correct answers that come from the expert to try to learn what the expert is doing. So you have a classification problem where the right answers are whatever actions the expert takes. So let's see what that looks like. <clears throat> All right, so here what you're going to see is for each of these you're going to see two games which are under the expert control and where the learner is just essentially building a data set. Every time the expert takes an action, it's actually running the perceptron algorithm. It's saying, what would I do here? I'd go east. Uh-oh, the expert went west. I, then it doesn't update, adding and subtracting feature vectors. 
what would I do here? I go north. The expert went north. Good. My weights are good. Okay, so for these first two, the control is with an expert, and the learner is just quietly learning in the background. The third game will be the learner uh, taking control. So here, um, one thing you should look at is, what is this expert doing? What is its behavior? So this expert's uh, reasonably cautious. He's scared of the ghost there. Um, it prefers to play it safe and stay away uh, a little extra long. We're going to play another one. This is that same conservative expert. It doesn't try to eat power pellets. Um, it's very afraid of ghosts. See, it abandons those dots, even though it might have had time. Um, it's happy to go back later to try to get those dots. Now, that expert's good, right? How's it able to do that crazy tactical stuff? It's running minimax. What's the evaluation function? The evaluation is function of something that doesn't really look at scared ghosts or anything like that, so it doesn't eat power pellets. Now, let's see what we learned. We're switching to learner control. It learned the following weights. Being close to food is good. Being close to scared ghost, it has no idea. It's never seen that. Being close to ghost is really bad, minus 0.72. Um, score is a good thing. Being close to a pellet is a good thing, and so like that. <clears throat> so let's see how it... Uh, does at this is now this guy doesn't have minimax. This is only a reflex agent um, trying to mimic what the minimax expert did. So let's see how it plays. See if it plays like the expert. You know, it eats dots and it doesn't die. No more minimax. It's just learning from having seen a minimax expert in action. It does pretty well. It's also pretty conservative. But the nice thing about apprenticeship is unlike reinforcement learning where you slowly learn to do the optimal thing, here you just learn to do what the expert does. So for example, if I show you a really good expert now, so here's a, a much better expert, some kind of ace Pac-Man. <clears throat> so again, this is the expert. And the learner's just kind of quietly doing updates in the background. This one's pretty good. Not perfect. <clears throat> this expert takes power pellets, and when ghosts are scared, hunts them down, and then gets back to the dots later. <laughs> now what happens to a kind of impressionable young apprenticeship agent? Well, actually, we can see from the weights Close to food is good. Close to scare ghost is good, meaning hunt them down. Close to ghost is bad, but not nearly as bad as it was before, just minus 0.21, and so on. This one really likes score. OK, so what does it do? Kind of, It does what it was trained to do. No minimax, just a good teacher. OK, so good job. Now, there are bad teachers. <laughs> so if your teacher, this is not reinforcement learning. You are not learning to be optimal. So if your teacher, like, your teacher has a death wish. <laughs> OK, what did we learn? Close to food, bad. Close to ghost, good. OK. You know. It does the same thing. OK, so um, here, remember, very important point. Totally different from reinforcement learning. It's not learning to be optimal. It's le like learning to be the expert. And whatever the expert does, that's its training data. Same machinery as classification in your project fives. You're going to first build a classifier for digits. You're going to build features for that classifier. And then you're going to get to play with this apprenticeship stuff. Quick question. Could the apprentice ever be better than the expert? Um, that's a, that's a hard question. The answer is it could be if there was kind of noise that it was able to average over. In this particular case, it probably won't be better because it doesn't have minimax running. You'll see a, a better example to that when Peter talks about helicopters. OK, we'll pick this up next time. If uh, anybody has other questions, you can come up and ask me. <laughs>